Good afternoon, everybody. This is Max speaking live from the Colosseum, along with the A team of Works Inside Rome. We have Marilena here, we have Salvatore, Giulia, and the cameraman Alex. Well, uh, we are inside the Colosseum, as you guess. You can see a few modern steps behind me. We are waiting for the group to be formed. You know, now we have to respect some uh, protocols. And then uh, we'll uh, follow a determined path, uh, showing you some uh, old stuff on the way. Okay, step number one. So we are slowly going towards one uh, very important gate, the entrance for the Caesars. Although today looks very poor, very dirty. So please uh, look on my left. This gate used to be the entrance for the Emperor, for the Pontifex Maximus, Vestal Virgins possibly. You see at the opposite side a cross. Why you see the cross? There used to be the box for the Caesars. The cross was planted over there in 1926 in front of Mussolini and Pope Pius XI. Wherever you find um, bright brickwork is modern, replaced a couple of centuries ago when the Colosseum was supposed to become an open-air church in memory of Christian martyrs. You know, once upon a time, the Pope was the King of Rome, and then uh, every old place was either uh, dismantled to recycle materials or turned into a church. Oh, here we have some uh, cleaned travertine limestone. You see this local limestone called the travertine resists the compression of uh, 300 kilos per square centimeter and is quarried nearby from a little town called Tivoli, little but wonderful. There is there the residence of Emperor Hadrian, there is a Villa d'Este from the son of Lucretia Borgia. Well, the Romans have built a big way just to carry over here the travertine necessary to build up the Colosseum. By the way, we are still working at ground level. So imagine how many arches going up to the very top of the Colosseum and making, uh, forming uh, four lines for a total of uh, maybe 300 uh, metric tons of travertine, probably more. And uh, wherever you find the holes, we have to guess there used to be lead inside, lead bars, keeping the blocks together, pulled out of the blocks and uh, recycled a few centuries ago. Galleries. They were for spectators to go in, like uh, modern spectators. People used to stop over outside. All around the Colosseum there used to be shops selling food, selling drinks, selling souvenirs like dolls depicting gladiators, lions, tigers, snacks of any kind. And there used to be barracks of gladiators. There used to be barracks like uh, the school for gladiators, like the Grand Hotel, uh, where uh, the ones coming from abroad used to come and sleep uh, for a few weeks during the season. Normally, the Colosseum season, like the Super Bowl final, took place in winter time in December. From the 23rd up to the 6th of January, sometimes uh, 10 days in a row, sometimes uh, every other day, depending upon the century, the richness of the emperor in power, well, we can say they used to fight during the season of Saturn. Saturn was the god of the afterlife. So we can regard from a Roman point of view the Colosseum being a temple built in honor of the god of the afterlife. But this is some religious aspect about which archaeologists and historians are still discussing. Not only the School of Gladiators or the Grand Hotel, there used to be also a few barracks for sailors, the ones in charge with the canopy. There used to be the storehouses for sceneries depicting jungles. There used to be real palm trees from Africa in order to recreate an exotic landscape for the morning program. There used to be the hospital for gladiators. And you know what? The best doctors who used to heal gladiators. Gladiators used to cost a lot of money. And there used to be also the morgue, where at night time there used to be managers going there to climb back the bodies of their, of their men in order to grant them a funeral worth of a professional gladiator. Who were they? Well, now we are going to move on top. And uh, on the way, as we keep... As uh, we keep walking, 
and we do the steps going to the second level, who were gladiators? Gladiators were prisoners of war. They could be convicts as well, or maybe volunteers. For the first case, convicts, prisoners of war, they were given one chance to achieve freedom, train a couple of years, fight five years in a row, average twice a year. At the end of each fight, if victorious, get some money, set the money aside, and then buy back their freedom at the end of the seventh year when still alive. What about the volunteers? How can they want it to share the same risk, take the same risk, and maybe never achieve their uh, free status at the end of the seventh year? Glory, fame, money. Gladiators were like football players. And that's why, after the Colosseum became the stadium for the Super Bowl final, many common people tried their best to enroll in the academies of gladiators. But listen, it was not automatic. I mean, no one can go there and say, listen, I want to be a gladiator, manager, make a champion out of me. No way. People had to go to a public office, and there was a magistrate called the Tribune who had to decide whether or not a free citizen could be despoiled of its political rights. So actually the Tribune could have said veto, and with a veto, the person could not become a gladiator. We're now entering second level. Imagine here we are still indoor. You can have a look at some genuine brickwork on the right. You can see the white pillar, which makes a part of the skeleton of the Colosseum. There used to be seven rows, each of them are made of 70 pillars. So 490 pillars in total. Pretending we are still spectators, Imagine we are walking in a gallery, and in this gallery we have to find our way onto the sitting section. For example, where you see that Italian boy, that used to be the way into the sitting section, Menianum Primum, Menianus Primus, that was for rich people. Rich people were the ones closer than others to the stage, the ones who could have enjoyed better the view of gladiators, hearing them talking to each other. Meanwhile, here on the right, pretend being seats for middle-class spectators. So in this moment, we are in between the two. Left, prime position. On the right, spectators sitting on the Menianum Secundum. Then you see some windows, and past the windows, you have to pretend being the poor, the plebeians, and on the very top, to be a section for ladies. By the way, can you see this modern sculpture there? A sphere with some light rays around it? Well, the sun god Helios. A few years ago, an architect, before retiring, wanted to pay a tribute to the sun god Helios because according to Mr. Piero, the Colosseum was a temple made in honor of Helios. Helios, sun god, who was portrayed out of the stadium in a colossal sculpture known after movies and documentaries as the Colossus. Colossus built in the time of Nero. Nero was the one in power before the Colosseum was built. I'm talking about the year 64 when Nero wanted his own Colossus being erected in the heart of his Domus Aurea the Golden House. In the very heart of his residence there was a lake, and after Nero committed a suicide and after Titus conquered Jerusalem, the money coming from the Temple of Herod was spent to finance the construction of the Colosseum. Built on the site of Nero's residence, after making room for the foundations of the amphitheater by draining the lake, so when in a while Alex will point our camera towards the very heart of the Colosseum, you will see the underground and pretend being there a lake. 
the bed of the lake used to be right at the very bottom. Okay, so please uh, get ready to have a look into the heart of the Colosseum, the underground, the very heart uh, where uh, about uh, 1,000 slaves used to take care of lions, starve them a couple of a few hours before the combat to drive them crazy. There used to be elevators. The number could have varied from 80 to 90. And you can also see part of the stage. You see the stage rebuilt in 1995, in part, pretend the stage to go to the very opposite side of the Colosseum, and then in front of us, the underground. Seven rows of walls containing elevators, so once in the past. There used to be ramps, there used to be trap doors being dropped all at once in order to enable predators to go outside together. Bears, lions, panthers, tigers. Meanwhile, big herbivores such as hippos, rhinos, buffaloes, elephants were pushed in from the two major gates at ground level. This was for the morning program, followed by a lunch break involving uh, clowns, lotteries, acrobats, execution of criminals. In the afternoon, gladiators. So this was the program, unless the emperor wanted to create something else. But usually, the program was divided into three phases. AM, animals versus humans, where humans were second-class gladiators. You see a showcase with a few reproductions of the elevators. You know, going into these dungeons is really a dream for archaeologists the best of which is a German gentleman named Heinz Best. He published a lot of papers, a lot of art, artworks on the, on the web, you can find them. So it's about 20 feet the depth of the underground. The elevators were lifted up by teams of eight slaves per elevator. So multiplied by 96 elevators makes almost 700, maybe a little bit more. You see a fence uh, which was uh, preventing animals from jumping over spectators. In white, you can see the reproduction of the first level, the so-called podium for senators and VIPs. I can tell you, never ever a single VIP was attacked by one of the animals. Only one accident occurred in the story of the Colosseum when a couple of cleaning men went on the stage they passed by an old lion, which was a mascot in the Colosseum. The lion was walking outside with a tamer. But, you know, when the two men had turned their back to the lion, the animal did not like it and attacked the man. One accident only in about four centuries. Okay, we are moving forward and out of this window. You can have a look into the gardens, which are hiding underground the residence of Nero, what is left from the so-called Domus Aurea, with the beautiful paintings. And then, uh, still looking out of the street, past the street, you can see the remains of the Ludus Magnus, for the ones of you who recall the movie Gladiator. These were the barracks where about a thousand used to sleep and exercise during the season. The night before the combat, they used to share a party in there, all together. Romans called it a free dinner. I like to call it the last supper of the gladiator. Here you have some genuine pieces. And listen, from an anthropological point of view, especially for all of us going to a stadium to watch football, to watch soccer whatsoever, I want to show you something very interesting, just to make ourselves feel like Roma spectators. Look at the snacks. The snacks on sale during the break. A rabbit, a chicken, oysters from the harbor of Naples. And uh, number 11 on the left, you can even see a little stove used in the stadium to warm up food. You can see some Roman glass. Very dirty, because in order to make it hard, the glass was filled with lead. And then you can also see on the left some little oil lamps. 
which were uh, the souvenirs on sale out of the Colosseum. Each of them uh, depicts a lion or a gladiator or maybe some uh, tools in use among gladiators. You can see some uh, skeletons, some skulls of animals, a wild boar, horse, bear. And then uh, little bones on the left, uh, also including the ones of vultures and ostriches. Can you believe it? Vultures must have been flying uh, right above the Colosseum during a day, during a game. Meanwhile, uh, ostriches were very popular, especially in the time of Emperor Commodus, when uh, one day Commodus had 90 of them run in front of his podium and then beheaded all of them by launching his special half-moon razors. Look at this mosaic depicting a female tamer on the right, a female tamer on the left, and a big tiger in the middle. The tiger looks like a pet. You know, it took two years to import a tiger from India over to Italy. So on the way, little cubs were tamed by, by specialists, of course, and then in the Colosseum used to play during a break, like we see today in a circus. You know, Romans invented everything. By the way, the cost of a tiger coming from there, coming from the far India, was the equivalent to 10 millions of dollars compared to present day's money. And let me give you some other clues about money. You see the coin here on the left, the one pointing out? Well, this was minted by Emperor Titus on the inauguration of the Colosseum. Only 10 of these exist in the world today. And the last piece, was uh, bought by an American collector, sorry, by an English collector, for uh, something like half a million dollars just a couple of years ago. Here is a piece of marble, which uh, uh, I witnessed to the opening of the Colosseum. I witnessed into quotation the inscription across it, reports that the Emperor August, sorry, Vespasian, Titus Augustus built the Colosseum out of the booty and we know the booty must have been the one coming from Jerusalem. Here we have a few maps of Rome when the Colosseum was used as a fortress by the Frangipane family. You can see the Colosseum is still intact in the 14th century. Later on, Roman families and popes dismantled the Colosseum. For the ones of you who are familiar with Rome, let me point out the Pantheon here, one of our uh, wonders. Look at the mausoleum of Emperor Hadrian, which is now Castle Sant'Angelo. And then on the right, the St. Peter Basilica, totally different, before the coming of Michelangelo. And all around, the Roman city wall, out of which only a few stretches are left. In the middle, the Tiber River. You see this pottery on the left? This pottery was uh, thrown into the underground of the Colosseum by Romans uh, living here seven centuries ago. I mentioned already the family Frangipane. You know, the Colosseum became a big garbage can. The stage on which gladiators used to fight was made from oak trees from Lebanon. So after the end of the Roman Empire, Romans recycled all materials, including timber from the stage and the open underground became a big garbage can. You can see a model of the Colosseum dating from the 18th century, a model which is conceiving a church to be built in the underground, a church made in honor of uh, Christian martyrs, but the project was never fulfilled because the underground became a stinky swamp. You know, the sewers did not function anymore, at the point, uh, all the conductors were blocked by corpses of abandoned bears, goats, and other kind of animals. And then water came up. That's why Romans, after using the underground as a garbage can, had to fill it up with dirt. As you can see here on these uh, paintings from a couple of centuries ago, the underground was totally buried with the new dirt. And then the seeds already gone, unveiled the skeleton made from bricks and travertine, 
on top of which Romans have built little churches, as the one of St. James that you can see there. There used to be a hermit living in the Colosseum night and day, he's portrayed here on the left. And there used to be ladies walking in just uh, for a Roman tea, going together for a nice uh, half an hour, an hour inside the Colosseum. Here we have a model built by architect Luke Angeli three centuries ago, out of timber. It's really, I mean, uh, to be made three centuries ago is really perfect. You can see the ground level, the podium, uh, with a little fence for the VIPs. You can get an idea the Colosseum was looking like a present-day stadium. Even the one made in Texas, finished a few years ago for the Dallas Cowboys, was a modern copy from the Colosseum. Colors are missing, but inside there used to be frescoes, there used to be staccos. And then what more? Can you see the colonnade for ladies? Atop the colonnade, you can see some uh, poles in which ropes used to hold up a big velarium, a canopy, providing uh, people with shade. It was not for uh, rainfalls. And there was also another uh, reason why raising a canopy, preventing gladiators from facing the sun and having sun, lay, sun rays reflected into the eyes of the opponents. So when in a documentary you see this big canopy, first of all, we have to keep it in mind, it was not raised altogether. Each slice used to weigh a ton. So imagine 80 metric tons right above the head of the emperor, above the heads of spectators, it might have been a bit dangerous. So let's say maybe 50% during the break, sailors, used to withdraw slices from the canopy. Some others used to spread the opposite slices. So listen, Romans were very well organized and gladiators, this was a must, had to fight in the shade. You can see on the right some remains from Roman benches. Seats were made from marble. Names of VIPs were engraved on. In this case, we know they come from the prime position. People used to come along with cushions. So if you are a middle class, if you are a foreigner, you can hire a cushion from one of the vendors outside. Vice versa, if you are a senator, there will be, of course, somebody carrying the cushions for you. Here we have a pillar with a tripod engraved on. This could have been a receptacle for incense, a perfume, or something else to burn during the game in order to cover the stink coming from underground. And here you can see a fence with a dolphin. Look how creepy. You see the dolphin looks very creepy because in gladiator's religion, the dolphin, uh, not in Roman religion, the dolphin used to be one of the animals carrying souls into the afterlife. So that's why this decoration was dolphin shaped. And remember that all decorations used to be painted. Okay, we are moving again towards level, uh, level one in the long gallery in which spectators uh, were diverted either downwards or uh, upwards depending upon their uh, social level and depending upon the ticket they had acquired because you know before the start of a season senators were kindly invited by the emperor to finance the games in exchange senators uh, were given a hundred of tickets to distribute to their supporters, clients, friends, relatives. So for the VIPs in prime position, tickets were always for free. For middle class and others, tickets were granted by senators or maybe they were to be bought. But for sure, each ticket was reporting a number and the spectators found their ways inside the Colosseum and their seats inside the Colosseum by showing to stewards the numbers engraved on their tickets made from copper, from bronze, terracotta, from timber, 
I cannot tell you really. You know why? Because the only genuine tickets come from an amphitheater in Britain, the one of Chester. The stage was 76 yards by 46, surrounded with a fence, as we saw in the plastic model before, and covered in sand. A very thick layer of sand, helping uh, Gladio's feet walk on uh, some soft carpet. You know, the best of them used to fight barefoot. At the end of each game, sand had to be replaced with a fresh one. Sand from the Vatican was the best to soak up blood of gladiators and a beast. And since the Latin word for sand was arena, arena became the nickname for the amphitheater. The official name was possibly Amphitheatrum Flavium, named after the, the emperors who built it, Vespasian, Titus and Domitian. But, you know, Romans simply called it the arena. Now, the arena was in use from uh, 81 with the Emperor Titus until the year 523 when uh, the German Emperor Theodoricus gave a show involving only local animals from Italy, bears and wolves, hunters, acrobats and clowns. We don't know when the last gladiator combat took place but must have been uh, something in between the end of the 4th century and the start of the 5th century, when the Roman Empire was declining, had been already divided into West and East by uh, Diocletian, then reunited by Constantine, and then split up again. In the East, gladiators were not always fighting to the death. They had to ask for a special permit from the Caesar in Rome. So in Rome, gladiators used to fight to the death, and this made them more and more expensive. That's why the point, because of lack of money, lack of financement, it was difficult to find professional gladiators. Also because in their spare time, their favorite hobby and a kind of a side job was bodyguarding. So at a point, one Christian emperor named Theodosius, he was born in Spain, stop them from working as bodyguards. And you know what happened? All the academies of gladiators shut down. They went on bankrupt because of missing the, their major financement. So that slowly, uh, fightings disappeared. They vanished from the Western Roman Empire. Maybe the last fight in the Colosseum was given in the year 415. Maybe we are just guess we are just guessing archaeologists are discussing about it. For sure the Colosseum was for one more century a circus, just for another type of performance, not anymore involving gladiators. Only the so-called Venatores, that at the eyes of people were second class fighters. You know, at the climax of the Roman Empire, Venatores were cheap gladiators, kicked out of a school by a manager. So when somebody enrolls in and by the end of the internship is changing his mind, or maybe the manager understands he's not good at fighting, what happens? Well, that man is given two options. Number one, accept a relegation into the school of gladiators, into the school of the hunters, sorry. Or option number two, accept a wonderful knife and commit a suicide in front of his comrades in order to get the last applause of his life. You see in front of us, the exit for the losers. Porta Libitina, the gate of the death. When a gladiator was killed, maybe during the fight or maybe after the crowd vote, like we see in a movie, the man, uh, if told dying by the audience, had to kneel before the emperor sitting on the left. He had to look into the emperor's eyes Meanwhile, the winner from behind had to thrust his knife through the left shoulder and pronouncing at the same time a couple of words, Mors tua vita mea, your death, my life. So after killing the loser, the winner was walking around the stage to get the applause from the audience. Meanwhile, some attendants, cleaning men, had to enter the stage, dressed up like the devil of the afterlife, Charon, 
with the big wings, uh, with the big hammer, approach the falling gladiator, hit his head with the hammer, and then with the big hooks, drag him, drag the corpse out of the exit for the losers. How come the name is a Libitina Gate? Because out of there, where we saw the remains of the barracks of gladiators, there used to be in old times the forest of the goddess Libitina, the goddess of death. And in ancient Rome, every coffin or every piece of timber in use for a cremation had to come from the forest of the goddess Libitina. Although at a point the city was uh, becoming wider and wider, so the forest disappeared, but the sanctuary of Libitina was still there, and probably the morgue for gladiators was built over there. After this, the gate was named Libitinaria. And now you're looking at the remains of the Temple of Hadrian. You know, when uh, Hadrian decided to make room for that, the Colossus of Emperor Nero, who stood uh, right there, right above the Velian Hill, had to be moved to the right. The face of Nero was no longer there. Many emperors had already modified the feature of Nero into their own features. So Titus did, Domitian, Commodus, Septimius Severus. And Hadrian built over there the temple in honor of Venus and Rome. So he pretended the statue of goddess Venus being there sitting, not visible from here because the porch is missing, the entrance is missing from today. Where well, you see the bell tower that used to be the Colossus. At the opposite side, there used to be the statue of the goddess Rome facing the Roman Forum. The temple was built about 60 years after the inauguration, 50 years after the inauguration of the Colosseum. You can see it down on the floor. The way Romans uh, used to push rainwater out of the Colosseum, uh, water dropping from the topmost levels. There used to be 50, at least 50 water fountains inside. There used to be toilets as well, although Archaeologists did not find 100% evidence of them, but there is something that I will show you on the way out. Now we are moving back to ground level. We can still see a mixture of ancient and modern altogether. And in a while, we'll have the honor of walking through the entrance for gladiators like uh, Russell Crowe Maximus in the movie Gladiator. Russell Crowe came to Rome in 2001. He came back in 2010. So let's say he has been to the Colosseum a few times, although the movie Gladiator was not filmed here in Rome, but was filmed in Malta. The steps are nowadays a bit slippery, a bit dangerous. Our cameraman is risking his life here. <laughs> and uh, here is, is uh, sadly, the way has been blocked for works in progress. But we can still feel uh, the atmosphere. And we can still see the floor on which gladiators used to step before the fight. So imagine them uh, parading around the Colosseum. Stopping there where you see the lady dressing in red. And then uh, when uh, a referee dressing in white from the very heart of the stage dropped a white napkin, pretend the referee to be some uh, 60 yards away, all of them had to move in, stop in front of the emperor's box, and yell a famous phrase, Morituri te salutant, Caesar, we who are about to die salute you. The referee had them warm up with the wooden weaponry. And then one attendant had to hold up a sign reporting two letters. CM, cum missione, to let people understand, will fight to the death with a chance of surrendering. SM, sine missione, not a chance. One lives, one dies in the combat. So, although the fights were officially to the death, 80% of them were including for the loser a chance of surrendering. 
because the best gift for a spectator was the side on life or death. Both by using a thumb, as we see in documentaries and movies. Although probably the gesture for uh, life was not really thumb up, must have been a thumbed inside the hand, pressed by his own fingers, because in the language of gladiators, a thumb symbolizes a dagger. Dagger in cannot kill, dagger out kills. The gesture for death could have been a thumb downwards, thumb outwards, upwards. Listen, does not make any difference because as long as the thumb is out of your hand, it means kill. And the word for kill was yugula, which means cut his throat. Look at the cross here. In the cross, you find evidence of lead. So, nothing to do with Christianity but remains of a lead water pipe. So pretend being a big hole in the very heart of this lead pipe, water coming out of here, and then a receptacle at the feet of the pillar to collect this water. So this, is, could, have, this could have been a refreshing corner for spectators. And because of the water pressure and because of the conductor, we can assume that in the gallery on the right, could have been some toilets. Toilets were kind of clubs where people used to sit next to each other and have a nice conversation. Good morning, how are you? There could have been at least 20 toilets inside the Colosseum, but again, we are just guessing that next to each water fountain there could have been one toilet. This is not really testified 100%. You see the capitals with the big leaves that belong to the second Colosseum, rebuilt in the third century by Emperor Alexander Severus, and even by, in part, by his predecessor, Eliogabalus. What happened? How come the Colosseum uh, fell apart? Not during an earthquake, since the Romans made it earthquake-proof, but because of a big fire, starting from the topmost level, when uh, during a summer storm, some poles supporting the canopy were struck by lightnings. They caught fire. The fire extended all over the travertine limestone, which is flammable. Now, if you have a look on the top of this capital, you can see evidence of lead pipes, sorry, lead and iron bars keeping the blocks together. Can you imagine at a temperature of 1000 Celsius, these bars expanded and then slowly they make the marble explode. This was the disaster. Like in a big domino effect, all columns from the top of the Colosseum uh, detached from the colonnade, falling apart. People heard a big noise from kilometers away from here. Well, it took five years to recover, which means 12 years or maybe 10 years only to build it, by including the making of the underground, I prefer saying 12 years. Then five years only to rebuild it. Probably in the disaster following the fire, a good 25% of the Colosseum was lost. So five years only to rebuild it, I think Romans uh, knew their job. In this uh, time span, Gladiator contest took place in the Circus Maximus. And now, since I mentioned it, I have to tell you when uh, coming to Rome, you cannot miss a walk through the Circus Maximus Valley because the Circus Maximus was five times bigger than the Colosseum. It was much more popular. It was in use 40 days a year. And it was the very heart of Rome because the chariot races were invented by Romans. Meanwhile, gladiolo contest came from Greece, came from Asia Minor, and became very popular only six centuries after the making of the Circus Maximus. So Colosseum, Circus Maximus, the two beating hearts of the Roman Empire. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure being your tour guide here, being escorted by distinguished VIPs, the A-team of Walks Inside Rome, well, we wait for you in Rome, thanks to our cameraman. We wait for you in Rome, 
from September for uh, guiding you everywhere. Thank you very much for your attention. Ciao.